Let's go to Ephesians while I still ramble. Ephesians chapter 3. And um, this is our source text and we're moving out from there. We're, we're about done studying the mysteries. And uh, something that I, I will admit to you, um, there's a lot of understanding that I have concerning what the mystery of God is and so on, the mystery of iniquity and all that. But we get into the book of Revelation and, and, and I'm, I want to take it literally and believe it the, in the literal fashion. But there's things that I just can't see and I don't understand when it talks about the mystery of the woman in Revelation 17, even though in her name, Mystery Babylon. Now, I know a lot about mystery religions. I know a lot about them. Um, like I say, one of my source books for all these years I've studied is Secret Teachings of All Ages. Well, Secret Teachings. That's that he's. He went through every mystery religion and siphoned them all down to there's one big gigantic secret that's been kept hidden f since the creation and it's still secret now. Nobody knows what it is. And basically it's the revelation of the Antichrist when he's going to be revealed and how he's going to be revealed. And so anyway, um, when we get to there, I'll just kind of cover some things that I know and uh, I won't spend much time guessing on what I don't know all right but anyway Ephesians chapter 3 let's pick it up uh, oh let's see here verse 7 Paul said wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power uh, remember it's always God's power God's power God's power it's never your own power you'll never you'll never defeat sin by your own will you never will Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. <clears throat> Isn't that something? That in my mind, the greatest saint that ever lived was the Apostle Paul. In my thinking. He, the majority of the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul. The profound doctrines and understandings of the cross... And the typology of the cross compared with all of the Old, Old Testament types and, um, and metaphors and analogies and everything else. Paul got it. Paul nailed it. Okay? And as far as his life is concerned, uh, we know he wasn't a womanizer. He didn't even, he didn't even have a wife. Okay? He, he, said, I'm, he said, I know I got a gift. <laughs> That's something. To say you got a gift, you don't need a woman. Okay? Ladies, I don't know how you take that. But anyway, Paul said, I don't need one. Thanks. And it's because God had set him apart for the ministry that he, that he had him do. But we know he wasn't a woman chaser. We know he wasn't a drunkard. We know he didn't, he didn't curse that, that we know of. But we don't have any mention of that. We know that about the only thing we know of Paul is that he had, he had a little bit of temper in him and, and some pride in him. And, um, we know that from the story where John Mark wanted to go with him on the second journey and Paul said, forget, you're not going with me. You fell out the first time. I ain't got, I ain't got time to drag you around. I can just hear Paul saying, listen, I'm going to work here. You can play Sunday school all you want to, but I'm going to work here and I ain't got time to drag you around and I'm not doing it. And John Mark's all, but here comes Barab uh, not Barabbas, Barnabas, who means son of consolation. And he says, John Mark, you go with me. Okay, let's go, let's go do some things for the Lord. Let's go, we'll go at my pace. How's that? And we have the book of Mark because of that. But Paul got into it and it got pretty hot between them, the Bible says. Paul got into it with Peter uh, over the deal where Peter was sitting with the Gentiles till the Jews walked in. He got up and ran over to the Jews and said, them nasty Gentiles, I don't know who invited them. And Paul jumped Peter to his face in front of everybody that was there and said, why, why are you doing this, Peter? Why are you, why are you being two-faced about this? I'm paraphrasing, but anyway. But in my mind, Paul's the greatest saint that ever was. And here he refers to himself as less than the least of all saints. That's, that, is, that is modesty and humility and meekness done right. When Paul, who was chief of all the apostles, uh, never, never took that on himself. 
called himself in Romans 7 the chief of sinners here in in Ephesians I'm the I'm less than the least of all the saints that's honest genuine humility uh, he said unto me is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and uh, truly truly uh, the majority of Gentile believers that have believed and are believing now and will believe until the Lord comes uh, all of that can be I mean we lead people to the Lord uh, based on what road Romans road who wrote that Paul Paul with the exception of John 3 16 and first John 1 9 Paul Paul laid out the entire gospel that we show people how to how to become saved but anyway, let me move on and make all men see, verse 9, what is the fellowship of the mystery. That was, see, there it is right there. To make all men see what the mystery is. I want to make it known to everybody. Which from the beginning of the world it had, had been hid in God who created all things by Christ, Jesus Christ. That's important. Remember that because I'm going to show you something tonight. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord um, let's see here I'm, I'm, I'm just going to stop right there and um, then we'll, let's pray and then we'll pick it up with what I have on the screen because I backed up a little bit to give you some understanding Father we ask your blessings upon your word tonight I thank you God uh, for all of those who are gathered with us tonight both here and online and Father, I thank you for this book. Lord, This I love this book. It is absolutely amazing to me. And Lord, it just it fits my mind perfectly. Because there's things in here, God, that I have yet to see, to understand, to dig out, to seek after as for hidden treasures. But I know they're there. And God, I, I believe now, Lord God, that as long as I breathe in this world... I want to know more from your word. And I know it'll be there. So, Father, if I spend this lifetime searching the unsearchable riches of, of the wealth of this book, Father, it'll be a life well spent. And, Lord, Father, just help me to be genuine. Help me to be uh, worthy, Father, uh, to, uh, to give out the things that you have given me. Uh, to make known, Father, the things that I see. And if I'm wrong, Father, then let the Bible correct us all. And Lord, we love you for that. So, Lord, just bless your word tonight. We love you in Jesus' name. And amen. Now, and we'll back up a little bit on this mystery deal. Okay? First Corinthians 2. Um, it has to do, uh, this part has to do with the spirit. How we understood the mystery. We understand the mystery by the Spirit of God. And remember that there are seven spirits of God. And they're laid out in Isaiah chapter 11. Three of which are the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, and the spirit of wisdom. Okay? Those three there. And then there's, there's four others. But, you know, I was talking in the message this morning about the number seven. And uh, that's where we're going to go. We're going to end up in the book of Revelation. And he's talking about the mystery of the seven stars. And, and what are they? So he says in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, I'm going to, I don't know if I, if I covered this or not, but I, I'm going to say this. If I say it, I'm going to say it again. I think there are things still hidden from principalities and powers. I do. I think there's things that they obviously cannot see that we can see clearly. Like, we can see that the devil's going to get wrapped up in a big chain and thrown into the bottomless pit. Obviously, the devil can't see that. And even as I'm speaking it right now, somehow, someway, God is confusing what I say... Uh, or what the Word of God says, so that he, they cannot figure that out. They cannot understand it. They don't, they don't have it. They didn't understand that in killing Christ on the cross, nailing Him to the cross, was the exact plan of God to destroy their power, 
over sin and death. Amen. If they would have known it, they would have said, oh, whoa, 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 back up. I think we're fixing to make a big mistake here, fellas. Hey, Judas, come back here. <laughs> Judas, come here. We'll, we'll pay you. We'll pay you a hundred shekels <laughs> if you'll come back. OK, but they didn't. They thought they were going to kill God and that was going to be the end of it. And they were going to get the whole deal. But it didn't work out that way. OK, it, it messed them up. Think of Samson. Why would the Philistines, they got Samson, they should have killed him. When they, when as soon as they figured out his power was gone, they should have killed him. But they didn't. Their pride wanted to make a big show out of him. So they gouged his eyes out, brought him out to the middle of the temple of Dagon. He has a, a boy lead him over so he can lean against the pillars. But that wasn't what he really wanted. And he wasn't going to tell anybody what he really wanted to do. He didn't say, leave me over to them two pillars so I can bring this whole building down on top of us. He didn't say that. He just said, leave me over there so I can lean against these pillars. Well, he did lean against them. He didn't lie. He told the truth. I'm going to lean against them. But in doing that, he killed all the enemies. More of his enemies in his death than he did in his life. So that was hidden from them and they didn't understand it. And they didn't understand the cross. And I think there's things about the last days that they don't understand either. Because they keep thinking they're going to win. And they're not. That's the beauty of it. So none of the princes of this world knew. Verse, so now verse 10. But, and I'm skipping over some. But, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. That's one thing to read the Bible and just get a surface level understanding of that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, there's nothing wrong if you if you need milk. There's nothing wrong with getting milk. But after a while, milk just doesn't satisfy you. Every mother knows this. After a while, the milk just don't let them sleep all night. So let's start giving them some some uh, cream of wheat to go with it, or whatever it is you give them. You give them. Let's give them something solid they can hang in their belly. And that's the deep things that the spirit the spirit has searched all the things of God and knows everything of God. And he knows where they're all at in the Bible, too. And his job, according to John 16, is to reveal those things to us, to his people. And we're reading the Bible, and we get it. We have an understanding of it by the Spirit. Lost people read it, they get nothing out of it. In fact, they hate it, so they just, they just don't bother with it. Now, Revelation chapter 1, turn there. I said all that to say this. Revelation chapter 1. This is one of the next places in line where we find a mystery mentioned. Um, in Revelation, the first chapter, we have John. And John is on the Isle of Patmos. He says this. He's telling us who he is, where, where he's at. Uh, he was put on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, to get him out of the way. They didn't like him. They, they hated John. Um, the, the historical things that we can find out tell us that it's very likely that the uh, Roman government tried to kill John by putting him in a vat of boiling hot oil. And that didn't kill him. We don't know how bad it hurt him, but we know it didn't kill him. And so I guess Rome, when they figured out they couldn't kill him, let's just put him out on some island somewhere where he can't get off the island and he can't spread his little gospel all over the Roman Empire. That's We don't want that. So there he is on the Isle of Patmos, and he says, uh, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and he was praying. And uh, in verse... Um, uh, verse 12, he hears a voice behind him. In verse 11, it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, and to Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now, um, people have asked the question, um, is it, Possible that these seven letters to the individual churches 
were written solely for those seven churches? Or is there some meaning beyond those seven churches for us living in this time today? I would say that number one, none of these churches exist. They're all gone. Um, so with the, the fact that it's the number seven, that tells me then seven being God's number for perfection, completion, the perfection of his word and the seven spirits of God. So that that's what that speaks to me by that number seven. OK, so John hears this voice. Verse 12, I turned, this is what's up on the screen. I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, voila, what do we have in the tabernacle that produce light for the tabernacle? Seven candlesticks of gold. So think about this, think about what this means then. In fact, I'm going to throw it out to you. What do you think that means? What do you think that signifies? That the seven candlesticks that the Jews had in the tabernacle and in the temple now are seen here when John first turns and sees. That's the first thing he sees is the seven candlesticks. What do you think that means? I have a little thing in my mind, but I'll hear from you if you've got anything to say. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Crickets, crickets, chirp, chirp. Huh? Who does? Okay, I think that's along the lines of what I'm thinking. It's the same spirit. The seven candlesticks in the tabernacle represented the seven spirits of God. There are a lot of people who follow the King James that believe that we're under a different dispensation and a different gospel and it's all different for us and I don't, I don't buy that for a second it's not biblical it's not scriptural what I see in this and maybe this maybe there's many applications but to me it's the same spirit the same spirit that is in Haggai it's the same spirit that's in Revelation. It's the spirit of truth. It's, it's the God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. How can we understand Haggai except by the spirit? How can we understand Moses except by the spirit of God? How can we understand that Moses is Christ with the veil over his face? And that's, that's how we know those things is by the spirit of God. It reveals them to us. So that's the that's one thing that I see there is that you had the you had the Old Testament type, the Old Testament shadow, but now you have the New Testament reality. It's the difference between looking down on the floor and just watching my shadow teach you this lesson, or looking at me teach you this lesson. Which makes you feel more comfortable? Well, maybe I shouldn't ask that. Which one looks better? Okay? But that's the difference. The Old Testament, it was a type. It was a foreshadowing. It was a prefiguring. It was a, uh, what was the word Paul used in Galatians? Um, uh, I can't remember. But anyway, it's, it's that. It's a, it's a foreshadowing of something to come. And so now he sees it. John sees it. The seven golden candlesticks. And he sees, now watch this. In the midst of... What does midst mean? What does the word midst mean? What does it mean, Hope? In the middle, thank you very much. Smart young lady there. It means in the middle of it. Jesus said, where two or more gathered together in my name, what? There am I in the midst of them. And it's something. And by the way, here he is. Here he is. 
Here he is in the spirit, in my heart, in my, in my, on my throne, on your throne. Then it says, uh, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, this is important, I'm going to show you something. One like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. This kind of puts me in mind of the high priest and the garment that he was to wear. Uh, the garment that uh, God instructed uh, Aaron to wear had to go down past the knees to cover the thighs and, and probably down farther than that because that's one place and there's another place in Isaiah that teaches us that the thigh not to be seen. Okay? And so uh, we have Jesus now and, and just to me, that's, to me that's, what I, that's what I picture him as. This, here's Jesus, the high priest here. Um, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his voice, like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Now, I've been saying all along now that stars are angels and I'm not wrong on that okay I don't care how many telescopes they put up there I don't care if we actually send a probe to the nearest star and the probe goes in the star and discovers what all is in there and all this stuff angels we can only see three dimensions of it there is a higher dimension about each one of those stars that you and I cannot comprehend we cannot fathom it we cannot see it we can't even think of it so he has in his right hand the right hand is the hand of power uh, nothing against left-handed people but um, remember Jesus put the sheep on what hand the right hand the goats were where? On the left. Okay, so he has in his right hand. We know that there's a connection there now. His right hand, um, he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Well, that matches what we know from Revelation 19, that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back with a sword coming out of his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword. Yes, It's literally the Word of God. Okay? It literally is the Word of God. So a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. How many times has Jesus been characterized as the sun? Okay? Now, I was reading this one day. And um, when we skip down to verse 17, he's going to tell us what all this means. And I was reading this one day and I went, hmm. When I saw him, verse 17, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not, I'm the first and the last. You know what I believe? I believe that when Jesus put his right hand on John and said, fear not, that instantly John didn't fear anymore. And you know what? I pray every now and then about my death. I do. Uh, having come close to it once, sometimes it bothers me. And I pray, God, when it's really my time, don't let me be afraid. I don't want to be afraid to die when it's really my time to die now if it's not my time to die I'm gonna scream like I did that day Matthew like a little girl but I want I'm asking God over and over again God when it's my time to go out of here I don't want to be afraid I don't want to be afraid and I believe John when John fell in fear I fell at his feet as dead. 
But he put his hand on him and said, Fear not, I'm the first and the last. And I like this, verse 18, I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I like that. I died, but I got better. I'm not going to die anymore, ever again. And so, right here, you could take this to any Catholic and say, Now read that to me and explain to me how it is that you think you have to kill Jesus all over again every time a Mass is said. While I was studying this afternoon, John, I, I, I've got a couple little booklets there uh, that people have sent to me, and one of them is a, is a Catholic, little tiny Catholic prayer book. And I just picked it up, and I opened it up, and there was some prayers to the Virgin Mary. And at the bottom, at, underneath those prayers, it, it told you that these prayers gave you so many certain days of a plenary indulgence. In other words, if you prayed this particular prayer for 300 days, you would get a complete, full forgiveness of all the sins that you commit for the next 300 days. Now, do you know what I would do with that? I would sin like a rock star for 300 days. If I honestly thought that if I recited this little prayer, out of whatever it told me to do, that I would get a forgiveness for 300 days, I would sin like a rock star. And wouldn't care. Because... The church told me I'm going to be forgiven of everything I do. That's just so evil. But what really got my attention was there was one prayer that was written specifically. It said to be prayed in the presence of a crucifix. Now, when Catholics tell you they don't pray to idols, they're lying. It says it right there to be prayed in front of a crucifix, facing a crucifix. That means they are praying to that idol. Got him. Now, let me move on. I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. I have the keys of hell and of death. He didn't. I, I just don't see in the Bible where he went and got him from the devil. I, don't, I just don't see it. He has them. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars. And I'm going, to sh I'm going to show you one, one application of this mystery. There's probably a bunch of them. And in fact, I know there's more than one. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in, the, in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are what? There it is right there. What are stars? Angels. There it is right there. The seven stars are the, are the angels of the seven churches. Now think about what that means. It means that there is an angel that is has charge of this church. That's what I think. I think God has dispatched or, or, or assigned an angel to be the angel guardian, the angel chief, the captain angel or whatever over this church, over other churches that are serving the Lord and so on. May be wrong on that. But here we have the seven stars of the seven are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now that's interesting. Because again, we know that the seven candlesticks represent the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits of God mentioned in Isaiah eleven. Um we know that in the in the lungs, the human lungs, the two lungs that we have the break the, I gotta say this right, bronchial tree. And that tree has seven branches on it, which are the seven. I, that's the seven spirits of God. But then the churches are also the seven candlesticks. Now, later on, and we're not going to cover this in this lesson, but. When we first started our study in the book of Revelation, we saw that Christ gave a warning to one of the churches. And I don't remember which one it was, and, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't take the time to, to, to find out. But he told one of these churches here, 
if you don't do what I say, I'm going to take your candle out of the candlestick. What, that, what I have to think that means is God's going to snuff that church out. That means the light that would have come from that church. Jesus says, I can no more have my light associated with this church. I want to take it out. Okay. Um, like I said, I can't remember. Oh, I found it. It's chapter 2, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Say that word fallen. And repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Now that's a strong... And of course some people whose doctrine doesn't allow for that to happen then that's why they omit the letters to the seven churches as having no meaning for us whatsoever. But I again, I just think that because there, he mentions there are seven I think that that means that they are fully and completely for all churches. I mean, when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, was he not also writing to us? That's how, that's how we got our doctrine. We got our doctrine from the letters that were written. Paul wrote letters, Peter wrote letters, James, Jude wrote letters, and now John is writing seven letters to seven churches. And to say that they have nothing to do with us would be like saying first and Corinthians, first second Corinthians. Let's just take it out because they weren't written to us. Romans wasn't written to us, so let's just take it out of the Bible. And I don't think we can do that. Now, uh, I was looking at this one day, and I was talking to uh, Brother George this morning after after Sunday school, and we were just talking about quantum physics and all that. And I told him, I said, George, I think this King James Bible is a complete and accurate blueprint of everything that God created in the universe. And he said, Amen to that. Whether we understand it all or not, I believe it is. Now, understand this, that for a long time, people did actually believe the earth was flat. However, the Bible completely denies that in the book of Isaiah chapter 40, where he talks about the circle of the earth. And it literally means a globe. And there are lots of other proofs that prove it outside of the Bible. The math, mathematics of it, the way sunlight moves, the way uh, the moon uh, moves, the way the stars uh, go in their paths and all this stuff. They're, I don't understand a lot of it, but they figured out by using mathematics that the earth was round and not flat. That it just, if you, the math proved it. Um, I'll give you another thing. The planet Neptune was not discovered first by someone using a telescope and spotting this blue ball. It was first discovered by two different mathematicians. They came up, they were watching the stars, and I don't know how they do all this. It's trigonometry, and I just barely got through algebra. But two different scientists, mathematicians, one in Britain, one in Germany, both figured out at about the same time that there should be a planet after, let's see, Jupiter, Earth, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, that there should be a planet after Jupiter and Uranus. And they calculated its position on a certain date, and on that date, Guys looking through their telescope, they found it exactly where these two mathematicians said it should be. Now, I think that's cool. Anybody who's got a brain who can do that kind of math, you got my attention. Now, here is the solar system. Notice I have the Earth painted in red. 
because I want you to imagine, and we, this is how I think everything is. I do think that the entire universe centers around one little planet called Earth. After all, God created the heavens and the Earth. So in that sense, I am geocentric is what it's called, geocentrism. Because I believe that outside of Earth, everything outside of Earth is heaven. It's the second heaven, we have this first heaven, the sky, we have the second heaven, all of outer space and the universe, and the third heaven is where God is, and that's completely unfathomable to us. We have no idea how far away that is, or even how to get there, or even where it is. But that's what I think, and I think everything is like this big giant ball of a universe, and Earth is right in the middle of it, and you know what's in the middle of Earth? What's in the middle of Earth? Huh? Hell. In fact, all of the angels that sin from the entire universe, where are they going? Not to Mars, not to planet B in the Sirius star system, but to the heart of this planet Earth. And it's, then that, that tells me, may not speak to you, but it tells me that the Earth is the center of God's attention and his entire work centers around planet Earth. So let's say that we're on Earth here and when we look up, not, not from Mars, we're not looking up at the sky from Mars, because we not, we're not on Mars. We're looking up at the sky from the Earth. And what do we see? We see the sun. And we see planet number one. And planet number two. And then after Earth, we have planet number three, planet number four, number five, number six. And number what? Seven. And how many stars did John said he sees? Seven. And stars are angels. Now, I've named these planets, planet one, planet two, planet three, planet four, planet five, planet six, planet seven. But that's not what the world calls them. What does the world call them, Matthew? What does the world call the first planet, number one? Who knows it? The first planet is what? Mercury. Mercury is what? Mercury is a god. Mercury is a god. An angel. The second planet. What is the second planet? Venus. Venus is a goddess. Earth is not a god. There's no god called Earth, right? What's the third planet called? Mars. Mars is a god. The fourth one is Jupiter. Jupiter is a god. The fifth one is Saturn. Saturn is a god. I think it's Chion from the Bible. Okay? The star of your god, Remphan. Okay? The sixth one, and I never call it what everybody else calls it. That's the Latin pronunciation of it. The Greek pronunciation of that planet is Oranos. My wife asked me that one time. Why do you call it Oranos? I said, I'm not saying the other word. Amen. Okay. But it's the, that's the Greek pronunciation. So I've settled with that. Oranos. And Oranos was a god. And then Neptune was what? The god of the sea. Okay. Da -da 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 okay. So, this wicked world has named those seven stars after their gods. But they're not. They are the seven churches. 
And go back and look at this verse again. When he said, verse 13, in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Where is the sun in relation to these seven stars? In the midst. Because they all, just like, have you noticed that the atom is designed the exact same way as the solar system? With electrons spinning around a center thing, a neutron and a proton, spinning around those things. And if it has more than one electron, then all those electrons are orbiting this whole thing. Because that's how the whole universe, that's how gravity works. Okay? And the, let me, here's what it looks like from Earth. Okay? Uh, I mean, here's, here's planet one. Well, I'm just guessing here. Planet one, planet two, uh, or planet two, planet three, planet uh, four, planet five, planet six, planet seven. This is the moon here. You don't count that. But that's what it looks like from the Earth is the seven stars surrounding the one whose face is shining like the sun. Isn't that cool? So that's just, that's just one. And see, we didn't know this. Man did not know this. Until, like I said, a few hundred years ago, when they first invented a telescope, they could see what Saturn looked like. They could see what Mars looked like a little bit. They could see Jupiter and they could see things orbiting Jupiter. Jupiter's got what, 12 moons? Something like that? Bunch of them. And they could see those things. And like I say, there was, this is Neptune and it's the last one. And before they ever saw Neptune in a looking glass or a telescope, two mathematicians figured out that it should be there and lo and behold it was because God is the one who created math isn't he and see God put everything in order didn't he can we calculate the rising of the Sun ten years from now sure we can that's what that's what you get when you get the farmers almanac you get the exact timing of the sunrise and sunset in your area already calculated out. Why? Because God put everything in order. <whistles> now, let me just throw this at you and I'll let you go. If, back in Revelation 2, verse 5, if Jesus says, I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So if God... If Jesus, we have seven candlesticks here, and how many are there supposed to be? Seven. So if Jesus comes quickly and takes one out because they won't repent, does he just leave it like that? How many are there supposed to be? I'm going to light another one. Put it in its place. That's all in the Bible. Um the story of Israel and the Gentiles because Israel would not follow God who do you replace them with temporarily the Gentiles see it see they had the candlestick all the way up until Jesus now we find out we are the candlestick and we are part of what lights this world and that's what Paul said in one place that we would shine as lights in the world didn't he so imagine those seven stars, those seven planets, being the seven churches, shining their light upon the darkness of this world. And where does, the, where does these stars shine best? In the daytime or at night? In the darkness, people. So as dark as it's getting in this world right now, that just means we're going to be shining brighter than we ever have before. Not that we have to. We're going to. It's automatic. Let's stand. Because that's I'm done. That's all I had.
Father, I love you. I thank you, God, for this world that you built, the sky that you put over it, the sun, the moon, and the stars. They all declare your glory. The firmament showeth your handiwork. And Jesus, I love you for being the light of this world and the light of my world. Father, would you bless your people tonight? Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. And Father, as this world becomes increasingly dark, there's only 12 hours in the day, and then the day is gone, and there needs to be a light shining upon the darkness of this world. And Father, as this world turns dark, then let our light shine unto men. Bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen.